taking uh, grades back for the first presentation. Um, they were pretty good all together. Um, and uh, I think I've said before, I don't care that much about grades. So if you guys put in the work, you'll get it extremely well. Um, so uh, next week, there's a guest speaker, uh, Dr. John Christian. Um, it's during this class time, and uh, you're required to go if you want the attendance for that. Um, but the room has changed, and I think Wendy sent out an email. So it should be a very interesting talk, and uh, not that long, so you'll skip 20 minutes of class. Um, so, uh, pick up from where we uh, left off. Um, this is the second part of the Sensing for Lunar Robotics lectures. Um, so, just a recap of what we uh, discussed on Monday. Uh, we talked about a uh, sensor it is a device that receives a stimulus and uh, transduces that to an electrical signal, uh, which is useful for compute. Um, and so, sensing, therefore, uh, is going from signals to an action or a response. And for mobile or field robotics uh, exploration, uh, basically what that means is sensing is a prerequisite for planning and acting. And so that's why it's so fundamental and so important, and why we're discussing it in detail. Uh, we talked about the uh, taxonomy of sensors. Uh, stereoception is a measure of the state of the world, of the universe. Um, and proprioception is specifically a measure of internal state. And in this class, we'll use that to mean uh, things like uh, attitude, orientation, and pose. So, uh, last time we talked about what sensing was uh, and stereoceptive sensors that are applicable uh, to the space mission. Uh, today, we'll talk about proprioception and then uh, some fundamentals of uh, measurement and the statistics that go with that. And uh, that will prepare us uh, for next week's lecture, uh, which Kevin will talk about all sorts of orbits, uh, estimation, and uh, maybe even common. So, uh, proprioception is the measure of internal state, state internal to the robot. And what we mean by that particularly is pose, which is position and orientation. And so, uh, these two uh, aspects give the transformation of an object in three dimensions. Uh, and to uh, secondary extent, we also care about the derivatives of uh, position and orientation. So that's uh, velocity, acceleration, uh, angular velocity, and maybe angular acceleration. So that's a change in position over time, and the change in angles over time. Um, so the ways that we usually measure this are uh, internally for angular velocities and linear accelerations. Uh, and that's because of the way uh, nature makes a physics that it's easy to measure an angular velocity, and a linear acceleration, but not the other values internally. And using an external reference, that's what we call the expropriaceptive sensors, uh, then we can measure the angles the, and the positions and the linear velocity. Where do you categorize the um, internal observations like uh, temperature, power expenditure, uh, vibration? So um, there's an argument about that. Uh, some people characterize them as proprioception. Some people characterize them as a category called uh, interoception, uh, which is kind of uh, the, the state of, of body that's not related to pose. Um, so those are kind of beyond this lecture. The intent of this lecture is to set up uh, trajectories, but. Uh, those sensors exist. They're part of the internal state. Um, in the for the purposes of trajectory, uh, they're not a part of the state. So uh, let's talk about absolute versus relative sensors. Um, so we talked about derivatives of position being velocity. Uh, an absolute sensor is a sensor that um, measures from a known frame of reference. It doesn't change. 
And a relative sensor is something we think about uh, when we may integrate steps of uh, velocity to get position. So they only tell you relative from when the sensor started up or when the robot started up how far you've gone, for example. Uh, so if you're uh, integrating velocity to get a position, you only know from your start location how far you've traveled, but you don't know where that is in the universe. So that's the duality of absolute versus relative sensor. So uh, knowing where we are is, uh, and I made this number up, approximately half the work of getting to where we want to be. So, so that's why it's important. Um, so some proprioceptive sensors uh, include translation sensors like accelerometers and encoders. Uh, radio triangulation and GPS uh, rotation sensors like uh, rotor gyroscopes, gyro compasses, uh, different types of gyroscopes, uh, vibrating structure and uh, fogs and RLTs. Uh, there's star sensors, uh, sun and earth sensors, and magnetometers. And there's some complex approaches uh, which blend sensing with intelligence like visual geometry. So uh, the things in gray will either uh, lead to a later class or uh, just very quickly give the high level and not cover in detail because <coughs> they may not be applicable to the mission or beyond the scope of the class. So how do we sense the translation and the derivatives of translation? Well, the first way we can do that is an accelerometer. So that uh, fundamentally measures acceleration on one axis. Acceleration is useful for a gravity vector, if you have uh, three orthogonal accelerometers. Uh, position, if you integrate uh, with some caveats. Uh, and also uh, to measure a shock or a force on the robot. So, uh, before I get to that, I have here a triaxial accelerometer. I'm going to pass it around. Uh, this is uh, somewhere in between what you'd get for a hobby robot and a more expensive one. It's not space rated, but uh, you can really see how small they can make these things. Uh, please don't actually touch the board and, and just touch the, uh, the metallic frame. <coughs> um, but notice that they have this uh, triaxial uh, or uh, orthogonal structure there. So there's actually three accelerometers. So uh, almost all accelerometers are what is called a reference mass design. Uh, so if we notice the law uh, F equals MA, uh, if you know a mass M and a force F, then the acceleration uh, can be deduced. So uh, what springs do is translate a force uh, into a change of position which is easily sensed. So, uh, this is one possible picture of a simplistic accelerometer design. Uh, you accelerate this entire structure to the right here, uh, and this mass, which is on a spring, moves by some uh, known amount. And you can look up that amount and get what the acceleration was. So uh, the spring equation is force equals some constant times the change in displacement. So these are commonly packaged as what's called microelectrical mechanical uh, MEMS packages, uh, which I just passed around, um, and that integrates several sensors. Uh, what they look like in silicon is this sort of weird pyramid-looking thing. It's actually flat; it's not a pyramid. Uh, so this will sense one direction of acceleration. Uh, and simplified, what you get is something that looks like this. There's a bunch of springs and a known mass, and if you apply acceleration, the whole uh, mass shifts because of the uh, flexure of the spring. And uh, what that does for this particular setup is change the capacitance uh, that's measured. So um, one way we uh, get an electrical signal is a change in electrical properties, so that can be resistance or capacitance or something else. <laughs> A uh, second way we can measure a displacement is what's called an encoder. So, uh, who's familiar with an encoder? Who knows what it is? Okay. Uh, 
So if you have a car, there's probably one of these in there. Uh, if you play with hobby robots, all the motors usually have this kind of thing built in. And basically what it is is just a bunch of holes along the circumference of the disc. Um, and so you mount this to uh, the shaft of a motor or axle of a wheel, or you could even drag it on the ground. And uh, what happens is uh, when the wheel rotates, this encoder ring will rotate. And there's a little light sensor there that uh, either sees through the holes or is blocked. And what you get are little ticks uh, over time. So you get a square wave of ticks. And then you just count them. So the use of this encoder to measure distance when applied to wheels is called odometry. Uh, it's not relevant for the lander, but definitely relevant for the robot. So uh, who knows what this is here? Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> That's not fair, but you can. Okay. It's great. Did, it's great did, picture. did nobody? Oh, it's a big dollar. Okay, but what's it from? A robot. It's a wheel track. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that yes. Great, thank you. Somebody, <laughs> won. Somebody did the assignment. I was about to take 10% off all your grades. Okay, so this is Lunacod. It's actually a model of Lunacod, but... Uh, you can see that it actually has a ninth wheel, right? It's got a little wheel that just sticks down and measures distance. And uh, why is this a good or bad idea? Can somebody tell me? Why don't we do this on our mission? It's a measure if you, well, I guess, like, if you go for bumps, it would calculate the bump. It's like, really just. Okay, yeah, that's one. Any, anybody else? Uh, so how would that be different than what we have uh, encoders inside the wheels? Oh, it's inside. Uh, so well, we're comparing Lunacod to what we are, are doing. Uh, well, okay. if you can measure it inside, just, just the, the robot, why put a sensor outside? Because you're linked, mechanically linked to the wheel. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, moving, good. that's good. That's good. So uh, what, ha what happens uh, when this robot turns? The wheel does drag across. Yeah, or it breaks off or something like that, right? Yeah. I don't think it will break off. But uh, so it's not very accurate. It's mostly uh, just a linear distance measure. Okay. So we have. Uh, yeah. yeah so can you go over like? Or I just you might touch on this next. But like, how do you tell the direction of rotation? Okay. I I'll go over that later. Okay. Uh, it was in one slide. So. Uh, Let's say you're given an encoder with uh, some ticks per revolution. Uh, you're, you're on the light sensor and you're counting ticks and you know the radius of the wheel. Uh, can somebody tell me uh, some parts that go into the equation to calculate how far you've driven? Uh, let's say you're in the car. What, what are the parts that you need to make that calculation? Ticks per revolution, angle. Okay, you're given ticks per revolution, you're given ticks counted and radius of the wheel. So what you want is distance. You calculate clowns per Tuesday, or you know, what, are, what are the things that go into the equation? Let's do some thinking here. Nobody, okay. <laughs> this, is, this is high school physics. Yes, Mr. High School Physics. X per revolution. Diameter of the circle? It's pi times the diameter, so it's 2 pi pi, okay. and that's going to give you the circumference of the circle, which you multiply by the revolution. Okay. I didn't follow all that, but it sounded correct. <laughs> <laughs> could, could anybody just simplify? Distance equals yeah. circumference times like. the number of revolutions. How about it? Ticks have to be in there somewhere. <laughs> yes. Proportional to ticks. Can somebody, can somebody give it a shot using the word ticks? Distance equals ticks. It's on the board. It's on the board. But it, what he said sounded basically right. So I'll give him the credit for that. Uh, so you can convince yourself by canceling out units, right? 
You have some revolutions for ticks, which is inverted from what I gave you. That cancels out this circumference measure here, and then you cancel out the ticks. And what you get is that. So, proportional to the number of ticks counted. Okay, so what about turning? Uh, we'll need more than one encoder because as long as that's contacted with the ground, uh, you won't actually know when it's turned or being dragged. Or anything. So, uh, usually you've got uh, two sets or four sets or four wheels or uh, maybe more. And so the way you would turn that into uh, a 2D trajectory instead of just a distance traveled is a diff drive model and maybe we'll cover that later. So there's many types of encoders. Uh, I just gave the high level overview of the simplest kind, which is incremental. It's just a bunch of holes and then you count, count the ticks. Um, so the way you would measure a direction in addition to the speed, and I, I say speed here, but it actually is rotation, so it's depending on your view of how the information is used, uh, is what's called quadrature encoding. So you have two uh, layers of holes, and consequently two light sensors, and they're coded in such a way, a binary code, where uh, if you move more than uh, a little bit in one direction, uh, depending on the uh, relative waveforms that you get, it's just binary, it's counting binary, uh, that will give you the direction in addition to the speed. The, um, it, so, it just, you, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but the point that there's, there's part, in part to respond to the question, do you see how yeah. that works? I see. Yeah. 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 I just want to know all the possible Oh, there are more, okay, so yeah. <laughs> and you can see these are four uh, just common ways to do the encoder wheel. There's plenty more than that, and there's ways to add other sensors, not just this light sensing. Uh, but, yeah, there's encoders have indexes, which means after you go one full uh, rotation, uh, then, uh, you know, you know exactly where you are in terms of uh, where the wheel is, right? So, if you know, if you start up with this wheel blind, you don't know how much, you don't know exactly where it is, right? But if you put a little uh, index pulse that only occurs in one location, once you get to that, then you instantly know from then on where you need to go. And so there's absolute encoders, uh, which is literally just a bunch of uh, tracks of light sensors, and there is, uh, if you look inwards towards the inside, there's a unique coding for uh, every single position. Um, and so, uh, what are the drawbacks of incremental versus absolute encoding? Well, uh, if you need a unique uh, pattern for every position here, and your wheel's only this big, or maybe it's this big, then uh, you very quickly uh, run out of uh, space, right? So, uh, absolute encoders may not give you the resolution, angular resolution you want, but they also give you basically the exact position within some unknown. So, uh, other translation sensors. Uh, there's radio triangulation, uh, which may track the lander, so that's, uh, uh, we went over stereo vision, you can triangulate and find some point in three space, you can do that with radio. Um, I believe we said it was too expensive to even consider for the mission. Um, and GPS, it's not available uh, very far off the Earth's surface, so uh, most of the way there we would not have GPS. Um, and it would be ridiculously expensive to set up our own lunar <laughs> constellation, so too bad. Uh, and you'll notice that GPS is the way mo most of us get around nowadays, so because um, it's so simple, and it's unfortunate that we won't have anything like that on the way there, um, and we'll have to go with uh, of different tricks uh, to get that position. Uh, in terms of robot odometry, uh, there's other uh, Hall effect sensors with magnetic sensors, uh, potentiometers, and visual tracking. So if you know how an optical mass works, uh, there's actually a camera that takes pictures real fast and that does the difference and gives you the linear position. Uh, if you remember Scarab, the robot uh, that Dave Kahnbosch talked about, 
uh, on the belly of that is actually one of these visual tracking sensors. And uh, I believe it does work very well. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about how we sense uh, rotation. Yeah. Before you switch topics, you mentioned that uh, with accelerometers, there's some caveats for sensing position. Um, could you talk about what some of those are? Yeah, I'll talk about that later. But you can imagine if you have a three-axis accelerometer, uh, why can't you just get position from that? I'm not sure. It's, I mean, you're, you're integrating. There's several reasons. Integrate twice. Yeah. Well, yeah, you in integrate twi twi twice. If you could integrate twice then your position would be inaccurate, but why can't you integrate that? What happens if you just turn it a little bit? Right, you don't, uh, what, what happens about the Earth's gravity, right? Okay. So uh, you're always accelerating downwards, for example. If you integrate that, you've just fallen through the Earth. So uh, just three axes of accelerometers is not enough to give you position. You also need the orientation, right? And you need some measurement of gravity. So um, I'll talk about a combination of that later. But uh, yes, if you just uh, kept it orthogonal to whatever axes you care about, then yes, you could integrate to get position. Uh, so sensing rotation. Probably the uh, simplest rotation sensor is what's called a uh, gyroscope, a rotor gyroscope. It's basically just a spinning wheel. So uh, we know that angular momentum is conserved means the wheel just keeps spinning unless you act on it with friction or torque. Uh, if the wheel is torqued, so if it's spinning and you try to uh, move one of the axes, uh, it, what it tries to do is reorient itself so that the spin axis is the same axis as what you're moving. So uh, how many of you have tried holding a bicycle wheel like this? Okay. So uh, if it's spinning between your arms and you try to turn it, it's like an imaginary person is you know, giving you a hand and it moves like this, or it may go downwards depending on which direction it's spinning. So uh, what it's ultimately trying to do is correct itself so that the rotation is equivalent to the rotation that you're, the equivalent axis to the rotation you've imparted on it. So uh, <coughs> things to remember are this, uh, this orientation axis, so this mystery uh, force uh, axis is perpendicular to uh, the spin and also your input, so cross product, and then the output torque that you experience is proportional to the angular velocity. Uh, so this is called precession. You can see that uh, in action in this little video. So it's spinning, uh, you try to move one of the axes and it responds by moving the orthogonal axis. So uh, it's most interesting if we translate that output torque as an electrical signal, but if this wheel is constantly rotating, it's kind of hard to measure. Uh, so in terms of design of these gyroscopes, um, this is probably the simplest. Uh, you'll see that it's actually fixed to the sensor rotate this axis here, uh, there's a spinning mass here, and what you have uh, on the output axis is a torsion bar, so uh, something that's stiff um, but can receive a, a torque. So this whole thing doesn't actually move, it only transfers the torque to the output. Uh, and so uh, when that bar is torqued, you can imagine that there can be a change of resistance or change of capacitance depending uh, so, what happens if we rotate that axis instead? So you can see that if we only rotate this axis, we get <coughs> what we desired, right? Uh, proportion, velocity proportional to uh, torque equals proportional to electrical current. But if we uh, rotate this other axis, what happens? Yeah. You don't get anything. Well, you don't get anything, or you what, get something wrong, or right? Remember the the way this measures is a sensitivity to a torque, right? But when you move that other axis, you'll get some signal. You'll measure into the 
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that's not very useful then, because uh, you know unless you can guarantee you only rotate this one axis, uh, you will get some erroneous signal here if this is the axis you send. So that's called cross coupling. <coughs> so uh, how do we solve that? What's, what's one way we can do to uh, solve or uh, kind of uh, cross-check that problem? You just want to use the multiple gyroscopes. Yeah, okay. You can use, you can imagine three of these in an orthogonal configuration, and then you can say, oh, well, this one's cross-checking that one, and this one's cross-checking that one. So that's the, the simplest way. I certainly don't see very many of those these days. They are yeah. a throwback. And uh, I'm not saying we're getting... Oh, so this one is the actual rotor gyroscope from some of the Apollo missions. So that's why I'm doing that. And uh, the gyroscope that we used in the first real robot from the Robotics Institute, Terragator, uh, was one of these motorized strap-down gyroscopes. And uh, we got it free as surplus from the Apollo program developing the lunar rover vehicle. What spins in that? A motor. Did you say, did you yeah, ask what spins on, in that? Yeah, so on a really tiny scale. Oh, there isn't any. Really. There isn't. So, on the, on the, so, no, no, I so mean, since you ask on the really tiny scale, the way it's done, and the way you can buy it, and the way you get it on a chip, isn't to spin a motor. I don't know if you're going to talk. I'm going to talk about it. Okay, great. Okay. Is that your question? Yeah. Like, how do you make something that I passed around? Mm, well, Basically? Smaller than that. Smaller than that? I have one that's like the size of a stamp. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, so no, that's no, roughly, no. the internals are, are roughly <laughs> the same size, right? You're talking about a scale factor of two versus, you know, this thing which weighs Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk about that. I will talk about that. You know, you say these are throwbacks, but I was just shopping for gyros, and I found some of these. They are far, far more accurate yes. than, than anything else that you can buy. So, you know, there are systems in uh, submarines, for instance, that can go for months without surfacing, and they'll tell you precisely where they are, and it's entirely official. Um, and they use, I believe they use gyros like this. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, what I'm going to talk about next. Yeah. So, um, Let's get past the gyroscope, and uh, it may or may not be uh, useful for the mission, but uh, since Red brought this up on Monday, I, I thought I could give a, uh, a better view of, of what a gyro compass is. So, um, what are some of the problems with the gyroscopes other than uh, cost coupling that we talked about? So if I just took this a gyro, put it on my robot on the surface of the Earth, what's one problem that we get? Don't know Okay, that's fair. That's fair. But what if you don't? You just care about relative. Even then, what's what's an obvious problem? Not a perfect sphere. I don't know. We kind of hinted on this on Monday. What is you have you have a break like this? Put on your robot, and you. Uh, the gyroscopic effect to measure position is uh, after 10 minutes uh, you measure your change in uh, angular position uh, you get some value after one hour you measure it again uh, is that value as accurate less accurate does it keep it drifts drift. why there's multiple reasons why you're, you're integrating what you know and or it's spinning yeah, okay, exactly. So what you've done is you've measured uh, whatever body action, the ego motion of the robot, plus the ego motion of the thing it's on, which is the Earth. Right. So uh, you just turn left this way. It, in the uh, universal frame of reference, you've got to add the Earth's rotation to that, too. And uh, what you perceive as a rotation uh, the equation for that is 360 degrees divided by 24 hours times the sine of your latitude. 
So the way uh, you can uh, convince yourself is this thing, which measures rotation like this, we're on the North Pole, you get one rotation every 24 hours. If you're on the equator, right, the rotation is completely in the orthogonal axis and you don't take any of that. So that's why you have to offset by the sign of the latitude. So uh, sometimes we may want a gyroscope uh, with some absolute reference point and no uh, planetary causing drift. Um, so we may call this north pointing. Um, and we want the heading value to be uh, independent from the rotation of uh, the robot and not from the planet or vice versa. And it turns out that uh, this way is, is easier. <clears throat> so if you measure the planet's rotation and not the robot's rotation, then you can cancel that out from some sense. So uh, one way to do that is to uh, use a three-axis gimbal, uh, like what is shown. And so uh, Red talked about this. Um, but that doesn't give you what you want, right? Uh, because the wheel will keep spinning in whatever direction it is. Uh, if you have this gimbal, then it will just keep pointing to whatever direction it started spinning. Right? So that doesn't give you a north or anything. It just preserves uh, position. Uh, and from the perspective of the robot, it looks like your gyro is just spinning around once every 24 hours. Right? On some random axis. So that, that's not very useful. So uh, the way to get it to seek north, uh, or to always point north, uh, is to utilize gravity uh, to apply torque to the wheel. So we said uh, the gyroscopic effect precession is if you apply a torque on an axis that's not a spin axis, it will try to reorient yourself to the way of the torque. So we can apply a torque that's equivalent to the motion of the Earth, then this will reorient itself to the spin axis of the Earth, hence point, point north. So um, this is the original Sperry design for a gyro compass. So what it actually uses are these mercury level tubes on this inner ring. And what happens is, uh, as the Earth is moving, uh, there's an imbalance, and that imbalance torques the wheel so that it always points north. So, what are some of the problems of uh, this sort of sensor for robotics? So these are very, these are always used on like ships and submarines and stuff. Uh, but, you know, for a robot, like what we're talking about, why would or would it not be useful? It's large. Okay, it's large. Um, but how did you know that? I didn't actually yeah. do the scale for this. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a connector there to the left. <laughs> the Bible's have like a okay. sufficient, and I can see the text on the okay. picture. But you are correct. It, it would be large, but like, why in the physics yeah. sense would it not be? Yeah. Like, you know, the should of what, like the race has to be large. Yeah, so um, part of that was uh, what Red had talked about, which is uh, what's the speed of rotation of the planet, right? Uh, you can imagine if this uh, fluid is uh, not viscous enough, and you've got very slow rotation. You don't get the, you don't get a real part, right? Well, you do, but um, the word I was looking for is there's a lag time, right? That's the time you can spin. So the other problem with that is, uh, what if you go very fast from east to west on, on Earth? Then what happens? Direction does the Earth rotate? East. Okay. So what happens if you go the opposite direction? You cancel it. Yeah. Bingo. So if it requires a torque <coughs> based on rotation to reorient, and you cancel that out. <coughs> so um, what repercussion might this have? Because uh, most things don't travel that fast. They, they may actually, but uh, robots may not. 
Um, so I guess if you're uh, trying to circumnavigate the moon, right, and that may be, you know, you may try to do that near the poles, you know, you could actually travel that fast. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure what direction the moon rotates, so it might be the opposite, but you can imagine that that's not a good thing. Um, okay, so we asked about how we make these small, small gyros. So that's what's called the MEMS design. Uh, same as with the accelerometers, you can make gyros in uh, these minuscule silicon uh, wafer type packages. So uh, they're super cheap to implement, and the thing about them is that there are no rotating parts. When you have that rotating wheel, then uh, you know that pretty much puts a limit on how much you can shrink. So uh, these operate using a different principle called the Coriolis effect, and uh, what that is is um, if you are within a rotating frame of reference uh, and you try to have some linear motion, there's an apparent deflection. So it's not, it's a fictitious force, but the fact that your observer is rotating, you've got to uh, include those um, accelerations. So uh, if you look at this rotating disc here and you try to fire a cannonball um, from the global frame, which is the top, right, you've made some linear motion and this disc has moved. But uh, if your camera is from the perspective of the rotating disc, uh, you expected the cannonball to go here, but it actually has made this curve there because of rotation. So uh, in order to uh, do all the forces for that, you've got to add a mixture acceleration. So uh, what it says is that this uh, acceleration is uh, proportional uh, to the rotational velocity times the linear so that's what, that means it senses velocity. And so we went, uh, we talked about how acceleration can be turned into an electrical charge, basically what this is. So instead of shooting cannonballs all the time from your little gyro, uh, the way they do it is periodic motion. So they have something that swings back and forth. Um, so it's analogous to um, a tuning fork. Uh, if you've ever hit a tuning fork uh, and then try to turn it, it will start wobbling in the opposite direction. So that's important. Um, so the, the rotating frame is actually the sensor, right? The sensor, when it's rotated, is a rotating frame. So this is how they're realized in silicon. Uh, there's some springs here uh, and some mass that bounce back and forth uh, vertically. And so when that uh, sensor is rotated, the vertical motion turns into horizontal motion that can be measured. And uh, the amount of horizontal motion, the frequency of that, is based uh, on how fast you're spinning. So if you notice that. And uh, you talk about small sensors. Uh, this is a uh, vibrating structure gyro. All right, so... Uh, and uh, one uh, special case of that literally is a tuning fork. So, uh, Luan gave the example of holding a, a, a spinning bicycle wheel and uh, moving that and getting the resistance. And then gave the example of uh, moving a tuning fork and feeling the wobble what if you could machine a tuning fork into the silicon and uh, then uh, excite that, have the mo excite that with a standing oscillation and have the motion of a turbine and measure the uh, resulting displacement from it? A literal machine a tuning fork, a tuning fork gyro, it's not a way to make So uh, last type of gyro that we care about, um, and I'll, talk, I'll tell you why I'm going through all these different technologies uh, and why it matters to have more than one type of gyro. Uh, and then we'll talk about whether that's applicable to the mission or not. So uh, fiber optic and ring laser gyros 
together are kind of the same technology, uh, different packaging. Uh, they're considered the most accurate uh, relative gyros. Um, and the way they operate is something called the Saniac uh, interferometer. And basically what that is, is there's two oppositely rotating uh, laser beams within a closed loop. And so uh, what happens is uh, you can envision this as if you're rotating the loop itself, one of the beams has to travel further than the other one, right? Because you're mo actually moving the detector closer. And uh, the way this is actually measured is an interference at the output. And that's proportional to the rotational velocity. And I'll, uh, I have a graph that shows exactly what happens. So uh, just very quickly, the difference between a fiber optic gyro, this is something I have here. Uh, please be very careful with this. It's probably worth more than you. Who in particular? The undergrads. The grad students. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, the difference between a fiber optic gyro and a ring laser gyro is one, uh, how you construct the loop, which uh, forces the light around and also uh, the nature of the light, uh, whether the wave is a standing wave or a, a moving wave. So ring laser gyros use standing waves, and uh, there's no medium which the light travels. It just goes through the <coughs> vacuum, uh, which makes that a lot more accurate. So uh, let's consider this optical setup here. Uh, we have a laser here and a detector there. A uh, series of three right angle mirrors and a beam splitter. If you shoot out the laser, uh, one of the rays will go right through the beam splitter, uh, hit the mirror, take a right angle, and then go through the beam splitter again to the detector. And at the same time, uh, because it's a beam splitter, it splits a beam into two uh, right angle uh, children beam. Uh, Go this way, that way, this way, that way. And of course, some of the light leaks back into the laser, which we don't care about. So, uh, convince yourself that the lengths of this, uh, these loops for the red and green, which travel in opposite directions, uh, are the same. And uh, what we actually see uh, in terms of perception is. We rotate this whole structure clockwise, counterclockwise. Uh, the red beam, which travels clockwise, uh, will reach the detector after a shorter time, traveling a shorter distance. And the green beam will have to travel a longer distance. And that shows up as an interference, a, a change in the uh, amplitude and frequency. So, uh, star sensors. I stole this image from NASA. Uh, and my question is to you guys, uh, do stars move? And also, uh, what's the parallax of stars uh, when you're viewing them between the Earth and the Moon? Can somebody answer that question? Yes, uh, very slowly. Yeah, okay. I heard several answers there that when you added them up is the correct answer. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, so, all right, so then the second part of that, what's a parallax of stars between uh, the Earth and the Moon? So, how different does this, the celestial sphere look like uh, when you're on the Earth and the Moon? Almost not. So the answer to both of those is neg negligibly uh, within the uh, environment of the solar system. So yes, I guess since galaxies move, stars do move relative to each other, but it's so slow and they're so far away, all that is canceled, uh, and there is almost no apparent parallax, uh, no difference in the star field. And so that's what we call the infinite star field. So therefore, if we're given a database of known stars and their magnitudes, 
when you take a picture of the sky with a camera, you find stars in the image, and you know any kindergartner can do that, right? It's a bright thing, it must be a star. Uh, and what you do is match constellations of stars with what's in the database. Mm -hmm. And you can just back solve for the orientation map. Because if there's only uh, one orientation for the star field, right, it doesn't move relative uh, to a, a global frame, then uh, if you know where you are based on uh, looking at the stars, you can always back solve for your orientation. Yeah? Does anyone try to do this on Earth? Didn't hear it. Does anyone try to do this on Earth, or is it pretty hopeless? I, I actually have a, a pretty cute uh, thing that some students told me about later. Uh, uh, so here's the thing. Uh, uh, here on Earth, this group invented what we call star grab. We can talk about it later. But it's fundamentally taking a camera, putting it up at the at, in the night sky. Then matching up the stars and uh, computing the orientation, and then also uh, using a, uh, one of these sensors that's being passed around to find the gravity vector direction, find up down, and from that to compute where you're located. The first time we tried it. Uh, we were in Shenley Park and computed that we were in Shenley Park. The next time we tried it, we were on my farm and computed that we were on my farm. Uh, the idea hasn't been pursued a great deal, but it can also be used as a means to compute an estimate of position on the moon. Uh, my memory is fading. Uh, hold on, would, would you go back to slide 13? Okay. But I'm unsure. I'm unclear. <laughs> uh, back to slide? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe if the one or there was one earlier or later that said no GPS on the moon. That was very early, like. Uh, I don't know, that was probably Monday's, but I forgot. No, no, it's today. It's, it's, still it's here. today. GPS not available off for It's start. crazy, huh? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's his fading memory. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'm not looking at the slot. Uh, this is an idea, right? So, uh, without, without, I mean, this has to be real quick. And Okay, so uh, the idea, this is in 2D, is that uh, you take a picture and you are uh, a robot. So this is uh, uh, known. You have a gravity sensor that can pick off the direction. So this is uh, known. And because you have something called ephemeris, which is the table or the lookup database of where the moon is, the moon re re orientation is relative to the star field function of time, this is known, and you have the information that you are somewhere on the surface, uh, so that the dimension is known, and uh, you can uh, solve that to determine where you are. And it's just a, yeah, well, yes. Well, wouldn't that be the gravity sensor be thrown off by like the like the angle of the ground? No. It's an amazing thing that um, with the three-axis sensor, if I tilted the table, 
if it's sitting where it is level, it'll say that gravity is down. And if I keep tilting on this thing, it'll keep saying gravity is down. I remember uh, because because it has several axes, uh, so it can compute which direction is down. Now, as that tilts, my observation angle to the stars also tilt. Okay, so you account. You just correct it, right? Okay. If the camera's pointed that way, but you're yeah. tilted, then. Yeah. Okay, so you can like assume, like you can correct such that you can assume that you're on a level surface. Yeah. What? Well, no, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Will it say? Will it still say gravity is down as you tilt? Dan Shuttle. I was. Uh, yeah. Gravity is this wonderful thing. <laughs> and, uh, then there is an incredible uh, technology, culture, physiology. You are pretty damn good. Vestibular sensing, yeah. uh, you have uh, uh, a, a sensing that's in your ankles, so that if you're off, you can know it. And then you have uh, a visual sense of a horizon. So you can put go through all those uh, variations by experimenting with you. Put you in a room. Let's say we all stood up in this room. And then without you knowing it, I slowly tilted it. Well, actually, I've been some in that situation. That I mean, does destroy it. By, by the way, by, of course, of course, you sense it. And let's not uh, let me let, let's not have this topic take the whole thing up. I mean, if you've ever been a gravitron, if you're moving, it doesn't work. So here's the thing: uh, uh, a, a robot is quasi-static. And if you chose to stop to do this, chances are that you would uh, uh, do, make a several uh, readings of your instruments. Uh, they're simple readings. They're simple uh, computations. And, uh, and you're not moving that fast. Uh, depending on how great you would be, the best paper, uh, so, so it's an intriguing idea. You at least get the idea that it works. Um, it'll put you in the right county. Uh, it might, it, you know, it might, it, it might do a lot better. It's a function of those sensors. Well, I've got my iPad sitting here to do it. It knows where down is. It knows where up. That's good. And, and I, by the way, you're right. Philosophically, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and then the question is uh, whether it puts you in the right state or, uh, or not. <laughs> you, you have the right idea. You got a camera? Exactly. You got a camera. You got a, a, a uh, uh, you, you got some kind of uh, gravity vector. You can assume you're on the radius of the Earth. You can look up in the Earth and cameras. And yes, a character like you could do it where you're sitting. Well, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Envision that there uh, might be several ways to use the star sensor. So uh, the first is what I mentioned is absolute orientation. So this is useful in a kidnapped spacecraft problem, right? So somebody clubbed the spacecraft over the head, went unconscious, and you wake up somewhere random, uh, and using you know the database uh, and star sensing, you can figure out at least what where you're pointing, what your orientation is. But uh, what are some of the sources of error uh, in estimating this absolute orientation and using the, the database and the constellations? Yeah. Uh, what's the possibility of mistaking one constellation or parts of some constellations for like a uh, constellation that's not actually there? You, you've got your question kind of answered the, the, my question, right? So. If you have a matching error, right, and there's, they do this very robustly, right? There's a lot of filtering, and the probability for that as well. But you can envision that um, if you take an image of the star, you know, some stars twinkle. Uh, you know, there might be two stars very close together that look to your image are like one star, right? But there can be errors in matching and making the constellation, right? And the reason you need the constellation is because you need a pattern to match. One star isn't continuous. 
So uh, do those same problems uh, happen if uh, you use it for relative orientation? So if you take a series of images as you're moving and just compute the relative uh, change in, in angle, is that still a problem? Is that as much of a problem? No. You said no why? Because if you... I mean, if you know about, or if you know where you started, and then you know what you looked at when you started, you know you're not looking at something this way off in a distance anymore. You'll know yeah, about yeah. what you're should be looking so at. So that the differences in the images are are tight enough such that whatever error you got from them should be reproducible across all the images. So, for example, optical errors and things like that are static between images. So, uh, you know, that's that's one trade-off that we might. So uh, these are two uh, star sensors that uh, Kevin has spec'd for our uh, lander. Um, so one of these is a, a fast, uh, low precision one, and the other is a uh, slower output, high precision one. Can somebody make a guess at which one is which? <coughs> Based on what you learned on Monday? Why is it? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Not big lens, uh, big hood, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you can kind of see that uh, this one has a wide angle lens to it, so it's got a, a larger baseline, um, but consequently the resolution for each star is smaller. And this one uh, has a very narrow angle of view and a huge hood, so it must be more precise. Uh, not quite a technical extent. <laughs> So uh, several students brought this to my attention on Monday, but uh, dung beetles actually use star sensing uh, in the relative sense uh, to find out where they are. Um, and I guess they did these experiments uh, where they had a visible sky, and the dung beetles uh, navigated along these fairly straight paths to wherever they wanted to go. And then uh, when the sky had like clouds or was Included, uh, they were all on LSD. So. <laughs> they actually did it by gluing uh, visible uh, uh, pla okay. clear plastic hats onto the bugs, <laughs> or some other kind of hat, like paper hats on the bugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With the star sensors in the previous slide, those units come built in with the right processors, or do you have to do the process? And the database. Oh. Uh, so um, you, you can imagine that you could offload the computation, but I think a lot of these have the databases. Built. Okay. There's only, I believe, uh, something like four dozen uh, bright enough stars uh, that you can actually okay. see very well and, and analyze very well. So um, the database isn't huge. The, um, this, uh, you get the idea that at minimum it is a camera and that the uh, rest of it is Summer student uh, uh, developed the capability here, and that person uh, uh, observed patterns of three stars. And if you have three stars, then you can uh, make the triangle, right? You have, uh, you, you don't know the dimension of the triangle, but you have a triangle. Right. Are these three different brightness stars, or are they? Didn't matter. some filter to reject the, uh, to, to, to get stars that were good enough to call them stars. <laughs> then you take a triangle, a triangle, and you can compute the uh, relative vectors of the, of the V formation. Or, okay. right. And then you match that against Then, uh, after you guess that you're looking at a certain triangle, that's enough information to do a lookup to find a bright 
star that should be in a relative location nearby. So that I so so then you hypothesize a star and look for it. Do you find the difference between your expected match? Uh, you have People here understand that it's a search problem, right? And people here, there are some people in this room that would eat that for breakfast. Just look at it in a, just have a lot of really innovative ways of putting together some feature that is observed from a group of stars, three or more, and then testing that feature against a database uh, that corresponds to claims to have uh, made great progress relative to the pollution of light in the terrestrial Earth sky. And they first made it work on a mountain top in a desert. And then they made it work down on the floor of the desert, not up high above the atmosphere. And then they brought it near the peninsula and then they brought it right into a parking lot near Google. And they claim that they made it work. What's the price tag of the ones that we looked at? Of the star charts? Yep. Top one's about 100,000, the bottom one's about a million. Okay. And that's a lot different than a camera, a lookup table, and some good software. And the people at Ames represent that a group of them, a group of them about the third of the size of people that are in this room, have uh, done it and packaged it uh, uh, useful for flight for about $25,000. But people say anything. Not everybody can pay a million. Okay. So, um there are other features in the celestial sphere. Um, the Earth and the Sun, when you're in the vicinity of the Earth, are both uh, unique objects in the sky. Uh, you can imagine uh, some vision algorithms that can pick them up, include you know, a giant blue circle for the Earth and a really, really bright, uh, large uh, circle for the Sun. So uh, they're both very bright and they're both very large. And you can envision uh, ways to track them with like photo cells or uh, cameras or some other. So they just, uh, these two types of sensors just provide additional um, observations. So uh, these are two sun sensors and a constellation of them that gives you uh, the ability to read the angles about the, the hemisphere. Um, and I guess sun sensors were originally conceived for pointing solar panels. So uh, the question is, um, are they absolute or relative? Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's the answer, right? Uh, you can imagine as you're traveling farther and farther away from Earth and moving, the Earth will look different. And so you might use that as a relative sensor, but uh, you may not identify exactly where it is. And um, if you're in orbit with the Earth around the sun, that's relative too. So uh, lastly, just very quickly, um, talk about magnetometers. They uh, detect magnetic fields, and they use three orthogonal, uh, what do you know again, uh, flux gate detectors is what they're called. Um, and usually they're used on or near Earth because Earth has a 
dynamo at its core, and it's got a um, strong magnetic field uh, with uh, no magnetic loop lines. Uh, the moon's magnetic field is very weak in comparison, and there's many poles, and it's got randomized directions. So if you're on the moon, that's probably not really true. Um, although they do use magnetometers in, on spacecrafts uh, near the Earth. So I have here a uh, not space rated uh, magnetometer. Um, you can see that there are three coils here, these flux gate sensors, and actually a little bubble tilt level. Um, I'll pass this around. Do not touch the coils. Uh, they're very, very thin wires and they'll come apart. So thank you. So here's a uh, magnetometer uh, that they use on Mars. Okay, so this is the list of what we cover uh, in terms of proprioceptive sensors. Would so you say anything about the um, bubble sensor that's on it? Yes, so uh, a magnetometer uh, measures a magnetic field. So um, generally that's fine and good, but if I stuck it near this chair and spun the chair, you get a different magnetic field, right? There's a rotating metal there. And so what the bubble level does is help uh, correct uh, for short-term uh, drift and accuracies. Um, let, me, let me try something. It, 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 uh, you can go into um, a uh, home improvement store like Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a digital level, right? And it isn't the fanciest sensor. Uh, you don't pay a hundred, you don't pay a million bucks for it. And it uh, it still gives uh, a quantified, fairly good uh, estimation of the gravity vector. Two of two of them you get right now. I don't know whether what the one that. Uh, or just passing around is a binary like a switch, or whether it is a two, passive. I believe two switches. It, it's switched, okay, so that's binary, and that's distinct from a variation of it that is capacitive. So it's liquid, but the uh, it, it's read as capacitance, and that's a little different than the bubble level. But um, consider the simplicity, the possible, uh, robustness and um, the economy of that kind of a sensor. Okay. So um, let's put it all together and, and we've hinted at this uh, through the talks. Uh, the uh, way uh, these are all going is that there's, there's no single sensor that will solve all problems or is the best sensor or, it's, or if there is it may be uh, too expensive. So um, the way people are doing these is to put different types of sensors together, like that magnetometer, uh, to uh, kind of uh, uh, fill the uh, problems with one type of modality of sensor uh, with the strengths of the other. And so uh, what we have is uh, one of these is an inertial navigation unit, uh, three-axis accelerometer, and three-axis gyro. So we talked about uh, why you would need these types of sensors together uh, just to integrate for position. So um, this is one uh, IMU. Uh, um, this is the Honeywell uh, MIMU, um, 17 by 23 centimeters, 4.7 kilograms. Uh, that's something we might use uh, for our flight system. So you take an IMU and uh, you put it with some other absolute sensors, like a star sensor or GPS, and that's what's called an inertial navigation system. So uh, an IMU is, is all relative, but once you add the absolute sensors in, then you can fuse all this data and uh, get a very accurate uh, position. So uh, that's kind of the basis for this Kalman filtering, which we'll talk about in the next lecture kind of a blown out display of what's inside of that IMU.
All right, so very quickly, uh, let me just talk about measurement. Um, let's assume a sensor takes readings, and this is a series of discrete uh, single samples. So we can have this uh, set uh, Z1 through Zi, which is the samples that a sensor took from a signal. So these uh, measurements provide some physical value, and those have units like meters, kilograms, meters per second, degrees, whatever. So let's take our laser. It shoots out something to this rock, right? It measures the distance zi. Right. And uh, there's some true distance, which we'll call d. So in general, what you measure is not the same as the true distance. With overwhelming probability, it won't be the exact same. Uh, no matter how many digits you write out, it's, you know, there will be some difference. Uh, and in general, if you take multiple measurements uh, of the same signal, they won't be equal either. Right. We say that the measurement experiences some sort of error, uh, and we can estimate that, or we can uh, represent that as uh, the measurement is the true signal uh, plus some error value, uh, additive error. Um, and we assume that the error is distributed uh, normally uh, with zero mean and some standard deviation sigma. And because Gaussians are additive, that means that the uh, measurement is also distributed normally, uh, but with mean uh, of the true distance. So this uh, inaccuracy value Sigma is a physical property of sensors. So just to recap, you've all seen a bell curve, right? That's called the normal distribution. And uh, what it is is uh, this peak here is the probability that you'll get some value uh, after taking many values. So the probability de uh, density function. And at the peak is this mean value mu. and Sigma represents the spread of the data, how it is. So uh, we call this uh, approximation of sensing the additive Gaussian white noise, so AGWN. So uh, what are some sources of noise? Well, I just wrote these down for some optical sensors. They incur, uh, include dark current, which is actually factoring in heat from the sensor and uh, cosmic background radiation that causes signal when there should be none. Uh, there's shock noise. Uh, since photons uh, are discrete, um, if you measure only a few photons, um, then the chances that your signal varies a lot uh, increases. Um, so if you've ever taken a picture with very high shutter speed uh, and you get a very grainy image, uh, that's because of shock noise. Uh, there's resolution uh, from quantization uh, due to analog digital conversion uh, and other things like diffraction and light phenomena. And then others, you can imagine you're vibrating while you take the measurement, uh, a piece of dust flies by, latency, all that stuff um, are errors that we, we can assume to be noise. So, uh, one of the statements that I've heard uh, and I won't say it's from this project, is a LiDAR has accuracy at x. x is larger than some obstacle diameter we care about, so we can't use the LiDAR. So let's analyze what this uh, means uh, in terms of the statistics and, and see if we can get to the root of that statement. So um, let's take uh, accuracy and let's take precision and plot them on a graph. So if you're shooting at a target, uh, if your spread looks like this, you're both not accurate and not precise. Um, if your spread looks like this, uh, you're accurate. You'll most likely hit the guy uh, after firing enough shots, but you're not precise. Uh, this is precise but not accurate. All, you have very low spread, but uh, you're constantly offset by something. And this is both accurate and precise. So, uh, accuracy and precision are two different concepts. 
Specifically, accuracy is how close the sample mean is to the true value. So uh, the mean of the sample distribution, not your particular sampling. And precision is the spread of uh, the sample distribution. So there's some true value uh, mu for the signal, and then um, there's a distribution for sampling based on the physics of your sample. And these are two uh, totally different concepts, and they have different meanings, uh, but if we want to improve them or work with them, they're kind of intertwined. And I'll explain that. So uh, if we assume that, that we have a perfectly accurate sensor, then just to, if you want to increase the precision of the sensor, all you have to do is take more samples and average them. Right? In fact, uh, the error of uh, your average of samples goes down as the square root of the number of samples. So, is this always possible? Uh, we have a, if we have a LIDAR and we want to measure the distance to a rock, but some data sheet says that it's n accuracy, can we always take 10 readings instead of one and average them? Okay, that's good. So it's not always possible. Um, and that's the kind of critical thinking that uh, I want you guys to uh, pick up from this, uh, is that you know, if somebody gives you a value, um, is it true? How would we use it? Is it always possible? Um, but there are some cases, uh, there are multi-shot lasers that do this internally. Right? Um, so if you have a, a perfectly precise sensor, uh, the way you can increase accuracy is by calibration. And that means taking a lot of samples, uh, averaging them and comparing that with a known value, and then you'll have some difference, right, an offset difference, and then you just subtract it from every subsequent sample. Uh, so that's called calibration. So uh, very quickly, um, since I don't have time for this, uh, I will just say that uh, if you have two measurements of the same signal and you know their uh, standard deviations or variances, the optimal way uh, to guess the true value is to weight them with the variance, right? A variance weighted mean. So uh, if, they have, if they are the same sensor with the same variance, you'll notice that this reduces to just the regular mean. So uh, the reason for this is that it's called the maximum likelihood estimator estimator of the true value. And uh, this is needed because the, it's the very basis of the common filter. Right? Weighting signals, taking an average that's weighted by the variance. And that's the way.